So if you're here with uh, children ages 3 to 5, those children are welcome to go to our Shine Kids. Uh, that takes place in the lower level, so if you don't know where to go, you can follow those families who are heading that direction now. Well, good morning to you all. Uh, this week has uh, been a bit of a tough one for me personally. Uh, last weekend, I took some of our young adults to a, a retreat at Rosa River Bible Camp our EMC Young Adult Retreat, and that part was great. Uh, we took a, a bunch from here. We had about 80 people um, that were attending, uh, representing about 10 different EMC churches. But while I was there, I managed to contract some poison ivy, and uh, I somehow spread it over my face and my neck and my ears, and it's all over the place. And uh, I was hoping it'd be kind of all the way cleared up by it today. Um, so in case you're wondering why my face is red, it's not a sunburn, uh, it's... It's poison ivy. It's poison ivy. We have a bit of a love-hate relationship. It loves me, and I really hate it. But anyway, it's enough about me and the poison ivy. We're not here to talk about that. Uh, we were here this morning to talk about Jesus and about the good news about who he is and what he has done. And so this morning I have a question for you. When was the last time you were invited somewhere, that you received an invitation an invitation to spend time with a friend, an invitation to a party or to an event, or to a worship service at church. Now, if you have been listening today, you will notice that you will have received, at a minimum, two invitations already. Ren shared an invitation to join us for our church picnic next week Sunday, and you also received an invitation to our EMC festival that's taking place the weekend after that. Now, Sometimes invitations like that can be dismissed rather easily because uh, they feel more general than personal. And our personal invitations, they mean a lot more to us because, well, they communicate that we are wanted, that we are accepted. And built into every one of us is this desire to belong and to be accepted and invited. And likewise, many of us can probably remember a time when we have felt excluded. And that is not good. No one enjoys that. Adele Calhoun in her book, Invitations from God, writes, Invitations shape who we know, where we go, what we do, and who we, be who we become. Invitations can challenge and remake us. They can erode and devastate. They can also heal and and restore. Being wanted, welcomed, invited, and included are some of the most mending experiences on the planet. So this morning we're going to do things a little bit different than I typically do. Uh, rather than focus on one passage, we're going to briefly look at four different stories this morning. One from each gospel account. Four different encounters that Jesus had with different people, and four invitations Jesus extended to people in different circumstances. So each of these invitations, they reveal to us uh, the beauty and the character of Jesus and his heart for all people. People who were both socially accepted as well as those who were not. So the first passage we're going to look at this morning is Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. And this is one of the first invitations that Jesus extends in the gospel accounts. So I invite you to turn there in your Bibles. I'll also have them up on the screen. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting their net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus called them. And they immediately left their boat and their father and followed him. So there's a lot going on in this simple yet profound invitation. See, at the very heart of this is an invitation to follow now, Peter and Andrew, James and John, uh, they were fishermen. That was their profession. 
Uh, this was not the first time that these four men had met Jesus. They would have seen about him. They would have heard about him uh, before this encounter. For example, in, in John 1, verse 35, we read that some of them were there when they heard what John the Baptist said about Jesus. When John said, look, the Lamb of God. Now that surely would have got some people's attention. And so when Jesus called them to follow him, these four men, they had an important decision to make. You see, this calling, which would have been an honor, also carried with it a cost. Because it involved leaving their profession and leaving their family responsibilities. And in verse 21, it notes that James and John left not only their fishing, but also their father to begin following Jesus. So in this invitation, Jesus called these four men from their current profession into a new one. Jesus was inviting them to leave their profession of drawing fish out of the lake and into their boat to drawing people out of the ways of this world and into the kingdom of God. And so throughout Jesus' ministry, we see the significance of what it means to follow. So Jesus, he was always looking for people that would follow him. And if you notice what, that Jesus, he did, not, he did not call people to lead or to be leaders. Jesus actually had little time for the proud or for those who thought that they had all the answers. And when Jesus' followers began to de debate among themselves about who would be the greatest, while well, Jesus would remind them that the first would be last and the last would be first. Because in God's kingdom, those who were called to lead are called to serve. Jesus was inviting them to follow. And this invitation to follow was a huge deal to Jesus. Because following builds character. Character, it, it, this, this following sands away the ego and it helps to shape the heart. And at the heart of it, Jesus' invitation to follow is an invitation to become like him, to literally be there for him and be one of his lead servants in the world. Now every one of us, we are led by something or by someone. Even the greatest leaders among us are being led by something or by someone, even if it is simply their own pride and ego. So if you look around the world today, uh, you will see that the pursuit of things such as money and pleasure and power are some of the main driving forces for the decisions that people make. And when a person is led by money and, and pleasure and power, it will generally result in selfish behaviors and prideful pursuits because it's all about them and their impulses. Therefore, first and foremost... Jesus does not call us to be leaders. He calls us to be followers, to follow him. Because the truth is, we don't know the way on our own. Humanity has proven this time and time again. We are continually lured away by power and pleasure and possessions. And therefore, Jesus calls us to follow him because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so to follow Jesus is that to follow Jesus that we might become molded and transformed into his character and his likeness. Because you see, Jesus, he loves people, he loves all people. And because of that, Jesus has never been content to simply leave people just where they're at. And because Jesus loves you. He is not content to simply leave you just where you are at. He invites you to follow him, to draw near to him. But as we notice in this passage, following Jesus, it also means turning away from one thing or, or something and turning to Jesus. It's intentional. So let's take a look at a couple more stories and see how this plays out in people's lives. So the next the first example we're going to look at is the story of the rich young ruler 
in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 22. Again, I invite you to turn there in your Bibles. I'll also have it up on the screen. And as I read this story, I invite you to consider the heart of this invitation. What is Jesus inviting this man to? As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him and said, Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. And at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. So the first thing we notice about this man is that he was genuinely searching. You know, he had money. He had some degree of power. The fact that the rich man came to Jesus with asking this question is actually pretty significant. It's an indicator that he has already come to realize that things like money and possession and power, they are not the be-all and end-all of life. He was missing something. And the question this rich man asked was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? And so Jesus, he decides to work with the question that this man asked. And he lists the second half of the Ten Commandments, the ones that deal with relationships with other people and thus are a little bit easier to verify. Now the man, the way the man responded to Jesus' statement indicates that he truly believed that he had kept all these commandments. And then in verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Now that is not an easy ask. Jesus, but Jesus, he was not toying with this man. Rather, Jesus was exposing the biggest issue in this man's life. His wealth, his money, was his God. Thereby breaking the very first commandment, you must have no other gods before me. The man was rich, so Jesus told him to liquidate his estate and give his money to the poor. The man was a ruler, so Jesus told him to take up his cross and to follow him, which would have been a humbling experience. Jesus offered this rich man an invitation to something so much better more secure and more lasting than temporary earthly treasures. Jesus invited this man to something greater than just himself, to follow Jesus rather than earthly treasures. Jesus offered this man the gift of eternal life, but he turned it down. His wealth robbed him of God's greatest blessing, eternal life. You see, it is, it is difficult to receive a gift when your fist is clenched around things like money and the things money can buy. And this man, he wanted to buy or earn salvation on his own terms. And when he decide, discovered that he couldn't, he walked away disappointed. And like this rich young man, Jesus is inviting you to surrender some of the things that you, that you may hold so dearly that are holding you back from knowing and experiencing the power and the presence and the grace of God in your life. And maybe for you it is money. Maybe for you it's something else. Maybe the Spirit is inviting you to surrender some of the, the excessive time that you spend watching TV or browsing YouTube or playing video games or on your phone or whatever it is. Why? Because God has something so much better. For you then that very well might include you know spending time with real life people you know connecting in a life group or, or serving alongside people maybe the spirit is inviting you to trade some of that 
mindless media consumption for some deep fellowship with God. God loves you. And he is inviting you into deeper relationship with him. And God is not against us having some nice things or, or against enjoying some of the good things in this life. But God is against having those things be the master of your life because they will rob you of life. Therefore, Jesus is not content to simply leave you just where you are at. He wants something so much better for you. And sometimes that may mean stripping away some of the temporary pleasures of this world in order to, that you might discover the riches of God's love and presence in your life. And interestingly enough, this is what I hear time and time again when faithful followers of Jesus endure various kinds of suffering. For it is often in those difficult trials that, that we meet the Lord in such powerful and profound ways. So the story of the rich young man, it, it's really a sad story. But in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, we find a somewhat similar encounter uh, with a very different result. So I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Jesus entered Jericho, and he was passing through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Now he was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead climbed a sycamore fig tree and sit to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come on down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once, and he welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus, you know, this was a, also a man who was genuinely searching. This was evident by him climbing the tree to see Jesus. Now, we don't know what all led to this encounter. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, like, there's just so much we don't know about Zacchaeus. Was he a friend of Matthew, right, the former tax collector and now disciple of Jesus? Had Matthew been praying for Zacchaeus? Was Zacchaeus there that day when Jesus spoke to the rich young man who walked away? Had Zacchaeus realized that money does not satisfy as much as he thought? Had he begun yearning for something so much better? Whatever the case, the Holy Spirit had been at work in Zacchaeus' life, and he responded. Now, it's important to note that it was not Zacchaeus' good works that saved him. It was his faith in Jesus that saved him. The generosity and the making amends was the outcome of that faith. And he gave with such joy because he had found something infinitely better. He had found Jesus. He had found salvation. He had found hope and joy and peace. In Jesus, he found acceptance and grace. And there is no amount of money that can compare with this. And that is the beauty of Jesus' invitation. The invitation to follow Jesus will always cost us something. But what Jesus is offering is worth infinitely more. An invitation to receive a new identity, to embrace a new way, a better way. See, no longer was Zacchaeus the cheating tax collector. He was a friend and a follower of Jesus. The last story we're going to look at this morning involves a woman who was enduring a great deal of shame. She had just been caught in the act of adultery. And the details are vague, 
And it appears as though she was a somewhat of a pawn uh, as the religious leaders were looking for a way just to trap Jesus. But Jesus saw through the trap. He saw past all those people who were out to judge him and were looking for a way to discredit him. Jesus saw a vulnerable woman who needed mercy. So let's read the story. This is John chapter 8, verses 2 to 11. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? See, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone, let any of you who is without sin, be the thro- first to throw a stone at her. And again he stopped, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. I think every one of us has some kind of moment in our past that we would like to erase from history. A moment of shame, of a foolish decision that haunts you every time that you think back to it. And I'm not sure what kind of moments come to mind as you think about this. Maybe it's something you said or something you did to someone else. Maybe it's something you looked at or some way you cheated someone else out of something that didn't belong to you or something like that. And the biggest fear that you have is, I hope I don't get caught. I hope no one ever finds out about this. And I'm pretty sure that's what this woman was thinking. But she did get caught. And this is one of the most shameful positions I can imagine a person being put in. Right? Everyone is pointing at her, pointing out what she did, and calling her for her to be punished to the extreme for it. And there is Jesus, right? the one full of grace and truth, exposing the hypocrisy of the people in the crowd until it was just the two of them left. Now what? And I put myself in the story. I can just imagine her heart just pounding like crazy. But it wasn't condemnation that she experienced from Jesus. It was mercy. It was an invitation to receive mercy and to begin anew. You see, Jesus did not define this woman based on what she had done. He invited her to receive mercy. Jesus took a horrible situation and brought good out of it. And that, that's what Jesus always does. He, uses, he used this opportunity as, as an opportunity to restore this woman. And so getting caught, I mean, in this case, this was the best thing that could have happened to her. Because she met Jesus. She received an invitation to receive mercy. And an invitation to a better way. Not the way of temporary pleasure or selfishness, but to follow Jesus. The one who would take away all that shame, all our shame, when he went to the cross so that we could be forgiven and be made new. But in each of these stories, there's this one common theme that I want to draw out. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus saw people Jesus 
came and he invited people. Jesus invited people out of an empty way of living and into relationship with him. He saw people who were lost and who were searching for meaning in all kinds of empty places. But Jesus came and he invited people to follow him because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you, if you are here and you confess that you love Jesus, it is because he first loved you and took that first step towards you. And so I ask you this morning, in what way do you hear God inviting you? In what way do you hear the Holy Spirit inviting you to take that next step in following Jesus? And it can be tempting to try to ignore that prompting because it, sometimes it might mean giving up some of those comforts. Right? It can, it can be difficult. And therefore, rather than trying to ignore the question, I invite you to write it down. In what way is the Spirit inviting you to take that next step in following Jesus? Maybe for that first step toward Jesus. Maybe it's that next step. And maybe like the rich young ruler and, and Zacchaeus, it's your money and possessions. Maybe like the woman caught in sin, the Spirit is inviting you to repent, to turn from those sinful practices and just to receive the mercy of Jesus so that you can turn and follow Jesus without that shame that has been paralyzing you. Maybe the Spirit is also inviting you to confess that sin to another person in your life to break the power of those secrets and so that you can walk with them and they can pray for you. Maybe the Spirit is inviting you to forgive and to be forgiven. Maybe the Spirit is inviting you to say no to some of the selfish ways you use your time and rather invest it in the kingdom of God by ministering to other people in your life. And maybe you've been listening and believing messages that have been spoken to you by the enemy or by other people in your life or messages that have caused you to believe that you are no good or that you are worthless or that you are messed up. And if that is the case, I invite you to turn your attention to what God says about you. Because in God's sight, you are a precious child of God who has been beautifully made in the image of God. A person with great intrinsic worth and value. A person Jesus loves so much that he went to the cross to save you and to welcome you into his eternal family. And he is inviting you. Maybe you have been through some of the most stressful times of your life and you have tried to fix everything and do everything you possibly can, but nothing seems to get better. And so maybe the Spirit is inviting you to simply rest and even weep in the presence of God and receive the comfort that only God can offer. And if you hear the Spirit prompting you today, I invite you, I invite you to write that down. And more than that, I encourage you to say yes to that invitation. Don't just ignore it. Take that paper home with you. Spend some time thinking about it. Spend some time wrestling in prayer with it. And there is one more invitation I'd like to extend to you this morning, and that is uh, to commit to a local church. And if you've already committed to here, that's great. Uh, but the last couple of years, they, they've tried to, these last couple of years have tried to force us to spend more and more time in isolation and social distancing. I'm tired of hearing those words. But growing as a follower of Jesus it doesn't happen in isolation. God has designed us in such a way that we truly need one another. And so throughout the New Testament, we see how important it is for, for followers of Jesus to commit themselves uh, to one another as they journey on this life together because we need it, because life is not easy. And we desire for SEMC to be a place, to, to be a people who will do this for one another. And just like Jesus is calling you into deeper relationship to receive the love of God, to follow Jesus and grow in our love for 
God and for one another. We desire for SEMC to be a place where, these, where this love and these relationships will be nurtured. And so we invite you. We invite you to gather together with us on Sunday mornings and in life groups. This is where we learn to invest in getting to know other fellow followers of Jesus who are journeying this life just as you are. Secondly, we invite you to grow together with us. And one of the ways we do this is by studying the scriptures together and talking about life together. You know, the Bible, it's always been meant to study together in community. And so we invite you to, to join our Sunday school classes. I guess when they start up again in fall, this was our last Sunday of Sunday school until, uh, until fall. Um, but also in youth ministry and other areas uh, where we do that together. And thirdly, we invite you to go together with us. Find a ministry to get involved in. Serving one another and our community is one of the best ways that we grow. And so another way that we grow is, or another way that we go, is also by giving together. And something special happens when we learn to give financially. And I've got to put this in there because, I mean, two of our stories were connected to this theme. But just look at the story of, of Zacchaeus. Giving is one of the ways that we invest in the kingdom of God and it gives space for God to give us a brand new perspective on our money and our possessions. And it's just so good for us. And we need that godly perspective because left to our own, our possessions will always lead us astray. So God is inviting you. Praise God for his boundless grace toward us. But with every invitation, there's also an RSVP from you. And some of these invitations can be hard ones. But the truth is that every invitation from God invites you into more and more freedom and into your true self in Christ. And following Jesus, it's not about checking off a bunch of to-do lists. It's about walking in step with Jesus in the places that he leads and with the people he's put in our lives. Therefore, say yes to Jesus, for he is good, he is faithful, he is trustworthy, and he will lead you in love and care because he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for who you are, that you are good, that you are trustworthy. Lord, we thank you that you are one that you gave your life for us, that you took that first step toward us. And so Lord, we thank you for the, the many invitations you, you, you give us and you put in our lives. So Lord, help us by the power of your spirit to say yes to you, for we trust that you will do good in our lives and through us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.